Hi, good to have you back again. As we continue our study, we're on to study number 16 now, and it's called What the Bible Teaches About Eternal Life, as you can see from your study guide before you. Now, you're proceeding with these uh, studies because you've received the whole set of 25 study guides. And if you need any, if you need any more, if you need duplicates, copies, just contact us and we can send them out to you free of charge wherever you are. Ah, now as is our habit, we're going to commence with prayer as we continue this study. And um, I hope you're enjoying these wherever you are. If you're in a men's group or in a ladies group, whether you're on the train, in public transport, you're doing it at home or you're doing it in a church setting, wherever you are, I hope you're receiving great blessings from these because this is wonderful material. And this study that we're doing today on eternal life is really going to open your eyes. It's a marvellous study and it's a great blessing and I'm sure you will receive a blessing from it. Well, why don't we commence and I'll ask us to uh, commence with prayer. I'm just going to close my eyes now. Father in heaven, we just ask that you be with us now as we open your holy word. Please bless us and guide us as we study this very important but also very lovely subject. And we thank you for Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, and it's in his dear name that we pray. Amen. Right, let's begin. The first subheading is reward to the faithful. What is our role in receiving eternal life? Let's turn to Romans chapter 2 and verse 6 and 7. And uh, we have Matthew, Mark, Luke and John, Acts and Romans. The first book written by the Apostle Paul in the uh, chronological order that we find in the Bible. So Romans chapter 2 and verse 6 and 7. And notice this, speaking of God, it says who will render to each one according to his deeds eternal life to those who by patient continuance in doing good seek for glory, honour and immortality. So this passage here tells us that God will render each person according to their deeds eternal life to those who have endeavoured to be faithful to Jesus Christ, to respond to the Holy Spirit upon their consciences and be faithful to the Word of God as they've read it. That's the first answer we have here. Remember as we're going through these study guides to press pause in order that you have time to write your answer or you have time to go to the text uh, which we are looking up. Right. Let's turn to the next one. It's found in Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, uh, which is connected with our first question. What is our role in receiving eternal life? Well, we, can, we see here that it's in continuous, uh, continuous patience in, in doing good. That's part of what we have to do as our response to the Holy Spirit and what Jesus has done. But notice what it says now in Revelation chapter 2 and verse 7. Revelation 2 and verse 7 says this. He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To him who overcomes, I will give him to eat from the tree of life, which is in the midst of the paradise of God. So the promise is here to overcomers. You know, each one of us have negative character traits. You know, we might be envious, impatient, jealous. We may be uh, lazy, slovenly, untidy, whatever the case may be. We may be in a, a number of things that are, are negative and poor and reflect badly on us. But God says that we are to be overcomers and we can be overcomers as we draw near to God and as we respond to the Holy Spirit. All right, let's continue on now. So we see that our role is to be an overcomer, uh, fighting against the rough edges out of our character and also those weaknesses in our uh, makeup. Question number two, how are the saved described? Let's turn to Matthew, Matthew chapter 7, Matthew chapter 7 and verse 21. How are the righteous described? As we get there now, Matthew 7 and verse 21. And Jesus says this. He says, not everyone who says to me, Lord, Lord, shall enter the kingdom of heaven, but he who does the will of my Father in heaven. Now, who are the people most likely to say, Lord, Lord? 
Well, it's referring to those Christians, those people who want to be faithful, want to follow Jesus Christ. But Jesus says, see, not everyone who says, Lord, Lord, not everyone who claims the name of Christ, not everyone who goes to church, not everybody who, who, who claims the epithet Christian is going to be saved, but those who do the will of my Father in heaven. So here we have another requirement from the scripture, from Jesus himself, that in order to receive eternal life, we must be cooperating with God's will in our own lives. And let's find out what God's will for us may be by turning to the last book of the Bible, Revelation chapter 22, verse 14, as it says in our study guide here. And uh, remember to write down your answers. And as I've said, every study that we've done so far, that it's important to do so that you can bring your thoughts down to, um, down to writing or you can reduce your thoughts to writing. It's all very well to read a verse and say, yes, I know what that means. But it's another thing altogether to write the, your answer down in a clear, coherent fashion because that helps your ability to learn. It also helps your ability to memorize what you're learning, to remember what you're learning and also to share it with other people. And also, once you've written it down on your study guide, you're going to have a constant source that you can go back to and refer to later on if you're interacting with Christians or if you're sharing your faith with non-believers. All right, Revelation 22 and verse 14 now, and we read this. Blessed are those who do His... Now, remember, we're asking the question, what is the will of the Father? We know that we have to do the Father's will, but what is the Father's will? In verse 14, it says, Blessed are those who do His commandments, that they might have right to the tree of life and may enter through the gates into the city. So what is the Father's will that we see here that's going to be um, uh, concluded with a reward? Well, it's for God's people to keep the commandments, all ten of God's ten commandments. All right, let's go to the next subheading. It says, the promise of eternal life with God. What reward awaits those who believe in and obey Jesus Christ? Let's turn to the most famous text in the Bible, John chapter 3. And we're looking at verse 16 here, John chapter 3. So we have Matthew, Mark, Luke and John. And we're going to John chapter 3 and verse 16. And we read these words of Jesus now. And he says this, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Our question here, question three is asking, what reward awaits those who believe in and obey Jesus Christ? Well, the reward is eternal life life. Let's continue on now. We're looking at the next passage and it's found in uh, John chapter 14 verses 1 to 3. As we conclude the answering of this question, John chapter 14, 1 verse 3. Remember, this is in the upper room with the disciples and uh, Jesus is soon to be arrested. But we read this. Jesus says to his disciples, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. What is the promise to the faithful? that Jesus Christ is coming back for you and that the righteous will be gathered up to meet the Lord in the air and be taken back to where Jesus is now. Where's Jesus now? Well, Jesus is in heaven, in my Father's house and many mansions. So the Bible uses phrases such as, as a paradise, heaven, Father's house, heavenly sanctuary. All this sort of language depicts the reward of and the place of the righteous. Let's continue on. Question number four. When will the immortality be given to God's people? Now, there are a lot of Christians today who are taught, who are instructed by many um, 
pastors, ministers, uh, reverends and priests that we have this innate spark of immortality in us. In fact, this is a teaching that is replete through the New Age movement, but we have this inner spark of immortality right there and all we have to tap into it, this divinity, and then we live on for eternity. That's not what the Bible says. The Bible actually, actually doesn't teach that at all. In fact, what the Bible teaches is that the righteous do not receive their reward until Christ returns. But what is the reward? Well, let's turn to it now. We're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 15. 1 Corinthians, and the Apostle Paul is writing to the church at Corinth in Greece. It's around about 55 to 56 AD, 34, 35 years after the crucifixion of Christ, which was in what year, do you remember? It was in 31 AD. And we read now in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, and we're starting from verse 51. And here the Apostle Paul in speaking of the second coming of Christ, uses this language. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep. What sleep? Well, sleep is synonymous with death in the Bible. The words are used interchangeably. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed. In a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised incorruptible and we shall be changed for this corruptible must put on incorruption and this mortal must put on immortality let's pause here for a moment it says here paul says that when christ returns there's going to be a mystery take place behold i tell you a mystery we shall not all sleep but we shall all be changed in other words not all the righteous are going to die but not all the righteous will be dead when Christ returns. And it says, but everyone's going to be changed. They're going to be changed from mortal into immortality and they're changed from corruption into incorruption. Now let's think about what these words mean because immortal means no longer subject to death. Presently we're mortal, that is subject to death. But when Christ comes, we become immortal. As I said earlier, there are many churches that teach that we have immortality now and that why when we die, it's just a door that we pass through and we continue on to a new world, a new existence. But that's not what the Bible says. The Bible says we wait for our reward until Jesus Christ returns and then he gives us immortality at that point in time but it also says that we're given a second gift and that is we are made incorruptible now presently we are corruptible that is we have bodies that break down we lose our eyesight we, we lose our hair we lose our strength we go grow old sometimes we lose our minds etc etc these are just the results of living in the type of world we do. But the Bible says when Christ returns, we're made incorruptible. We have all the strength and the vigor of youth. We're no longer subject to death. But it has a further application as well, because incorruptible also means we no longer have the drawings to sin. You see, in our corrupted state, in our in corruptible state, we have a fallen nature. And we have natural inclinations to do wrong. We have natural inclinations to sin, to rebel against God. It's part and parcel of being a fallen man, fallen woman in this world. However, when Christ comes, that fallen nature is replaced with an unfallen nature. We have the nature which Adam had before he fell in the Garden of Eden, as depicted in Genesis chapter 3. So we are no longer we will no longer have those natural drawings to sin. We won't have that fallen nature. So not only are we made incorruptible and immortal with all the strength and vigor of youth, we, are no, we no longer will have the natural drawings to sin and rebellion as we do now. Let's move on to some more words by the Apostle Paul as he uh, describes the second coming of Christ in a way that could never be depicted as, as, as a secret. And he says in 1 Thessalonians, let's turn to it now, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4, verse 16 and 17. So we're in 1 Corinthians and then we go past 2 Corinthians, we go past Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and then we're in 1 Thessalonians chapter 4. And Paul, the writer of this letter, letter to the church of Thessalonica says this, he says, 
For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout, with the voice of an archangel and with the trumpet of God, and the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord. The, the Apostle Paul describes the second coming in this fashion. He says the righteous dead are resurrected and they're gathered up to meet the Lord in the air. And those that are remaining alive, that is the faithful at the second coming of Christ, they too are also gathered up to meet the Lord in the air. And from 1 Corinthians, we realize that it's that time Time, the righteous receive immortality and are made incorruptible. No longer have those natural drawings to sin, no longer have bodies that break down. All right, let's move on now. Our second, our third subheading is glimpses of heaven. Well, let's go to question five. It says, what has God prepared for those who love him? Now, remember to press pause if you need time to write your answers down or if you need more time to uh, look up the text. So we're going to 1 Corinthians chapter 2. So we're going back to where we were earlier. 1 Corinthians now chapter 2 and verse 9. And what has God prepared for those who love him? Well, let's notice this. Paul says, But as it is written, I has not seen, nor ear heard, nor have entered into the hearts of man the things that God has prepared for those that love him. Paul is saying here, we cannot even imagine what eternal life is going to be like. The Bible gives us glimpses of what eternal life is going to be like. It alludes to certain things that God's people can expect in the life to come. But Paul says here that we can't even imagine how wonderful the life to come is going to be. All right, let's go to question number six now. In the new life, what will be different? Let's go to the last book of the Bible, and it's Revelation. Revelation 21 on your study guide. Revelation 21, verses 1 to 5. And Revelation 21, 1 to 5 is talking about an incredible event which happens well after the second coming of Christ. In fact, 1,000 years after the second coming of Christ. And we're going to learn about that the 1,000 years after this study. This is stu that will be study number 17. And I'm, I'm very much looking forward to sharing that truth with you. Here we are. Revelation chapter 21, it says this. Now I saw a new heaven and a new earth. What does it say there? A new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. Also there was no more sea. Then I, John, saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. Do you remember in John chapter 14, Jesus said, In my Father's house are many mansions. Well, this is what Jesus was referring to. It's the new Jerusalem. It's... Uh, it's uh, it says she's come down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice in verse 3 from heaven saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is with men, and he will dwell with them, and they will be his people. God himself will be with them and be their God. And God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There shall be no more death, nor sorrow, nor crying. There shall be no more pain, for the former things have passed away. The question is asking here, what has God, uh, in the new life, question six, in the new life, what will be different? Well, it says here, the, the old earth has passed away. The old heaven has passed away. That's referring to the atmospheric heaven. Remember in the Bible, there are three types of heaven. There is the atmospheric heaven, in which we dwell, and then there is the, um, the celestial heaven, where we have the stars, the moons, the suns, etc., or the stars which are suns, uh, comets, asteroids, those sort of things. And then we have the, the third heaven, the place where God dwells. Now, when it talks about the 
uh, there'll be a new heavens, plural, and a new earth. It's referring, first of all, to the earth in which we live here. It's going to be restored to its Edenic beauty, but we're going to look at that more in more de detail in another study. Secondly, when it talks about the new heavens, plural, it's talking about the atmospheric heaven that has been affected by sin, and it's talking about this, um, the um, celestial heavens which have been blighted also by sin, transgression, and rebellion as well. Well, so they are going to be changed, but then it continues on and says there'll be, a, um, it says that God will be with men. They will be able to communicate with God face to face. And it says there'll be no more tears in the life to come in that part. It says there'll be no more sorrow. There'll be no more death. There'll be no more crying for the former things have passed away. Isn't that wonderful news? Think about that. No more suffering. Families will no longer be torn apart by, by death. Husbands will, will not be torn apart from their, their wives. Uh, children will be reunited with their families, their mothers, their fathers at the time of Christ's second coming. Never to be separated again is the Bible promise. But we read on here in chapter 7 and verse 16 and 17 in uh, the book of Revelation, chapter 7 and 17. 16 and 17 and so in in the new life what will be different well we also read this here John in vision he says they shall neither hunger anymore nor thirst anymore the sun shall not strike them nor any heat for the lamb who is in the midst of the throne will shepherd them and lead them to living fountains of water and God will wipe away every tear from their eyes. You see that? No more hunger, no more death, no more pain, no more suffering in the life to come. Let's continue on now. As we turn the page, we're on page two, and it's identified as citizens in the new earth. All right. Remember, we've heard uh, and we've studied that at Christ's second coming, the righteous are gathered up to meet the Lord in the air. But the final abode, the final home of God's people, we will discover in our next lesson is actually going to be this earth. This is really introductory, but it's not this earth as we know it. It's the new earth that God restores to its Edenic beauty. Okay, here we go. How is the final home of the righteous identified? Let's turn to Second Peter now. Remember, 2 Peter is just before Romans, it's before Jude, it's before 1st, 2nd and 3rd John. And we have 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13. Remember to press pause if you don't have enough time to write your answers or to look up the Bible verses. 2 Peter chapter 3 and verse 13. Nevertheless, we according to his promise look for, what does it say in your Bible? New heavens and what? a new earth in which righteousness dwells. So, here in question 8, it says, how is the final home of the righteous identified? It's identified as a new heavens and as a new earth. All right, let's continue on. And uh, that was question 7. Now we're going to question 8. How are God's people and the new earth described? Let's go to Isaiah chapter 35 and verses 5 to 10. So Isaiah chapter 35, which is right in the middle of our Bible. It's after Psalms, it's after Ecclesiastes, it's after Proverbs. And we're looking at Isaiah chapter 35 and verses 5 to 10. And we're reading... From verse 5 it says, Then the eyes of the blind shall be opened, and the ears of the deaf shall be unstopped. Then the lame shall leap, leap like a deer, and the tongue of the dumb shall sing. The water shall bore, bore, burst forth in the wilderness, and the streams in the desert. The parched ground shall become a pool, and the thirsty land springs of water. In the habitation of jackals where each lay, there shall be grass with reeds and rushes. A highway shall be there, and a road, and it shall be called the highway of holiness. The unclean shall not pass over it, but it shall be for others. Whoever walks the road, although a fool, shall not 
go astray. No lion shall be there, nor shall any ravenous beast go up on it. It shall not be found there, but the redeemed shall walk there. And the ransom of the Lord shall return and come to Zion with singing, with everlasting joy in their heads, and they shall obtain joy and gladness, and sorrow and sighing shall flee away. Now, in verse 10, it says, and shall come to Zion. Zion is just referring to the mountain of God, which we would call the new Jerusalem in this setting here. So what does it tell us? It tells us that the eyes of the blind will be opened, the deaf will hear, the mute will speak. It talks about the habitation of, um, uh, of deserts and wilderness places will become fertile and beautiful areas. It tells us here that um, uh, no ravenous beast will be in that location. And then it concludes by si saying there'll be no sorrow, there'll be no sighing in the life to come. This is the great promise of God's word to men and women today. Let's continue on now. Question number nine. What can the righteous look forward to? Let's turn to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 60. Well, we're in Isaiah already, but we're going to Isaiah chapter 65, and we're looking at verses 21 to 25. So Isaiah chapter 65 and verses 21 to 25 in our study guide. And here we read, it says, They shall build houses and inhabit them. Isn't it interesting that you hear many churches today, they teach about the life to come, and they say that in the life to come, uh, men and women will be dressed in nappies, playing harps, floating around on clouds. That's not what the Bible teaches. The Bible teaches something entirely different. The Bible actually teaches that our mental acumen will increase. It will be a time where our abilities will grow and that the, uh, the study and, and the increasing knowledge will not weary the mind at all. And in fact, notice what else God's people do. In verse 21, it says, they shall build houses and inhabit them. Remember, it's the new heavens and the new earth. It's Eden restored. Then it says, they shall build houses and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and eat their fruit. They shall not build and another inhabit. They shall not plant and another eat. For as the day of a tree, so shall be the days of my people. And my elect shall long enjoy the work of their hands. They shall not labor in vain, nor bring forth children for trouble. For they shall be the descendants of the blessed of the Lord and their offspring with them. And it shall come to pass that before they call, I will answer. And while they are still speaking, I will hear. Verse 25, the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The dust shall be the serpent's food. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, says the Lord. This is the promise of Scripture, that in the life to come, even the animals, there'll be no ravenous beasts in the life to come. It says here that the wolf and the lamb shall feed together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. Like the ox. So there's going to be no carnivores all the creation is going to be herbivorial, so to speak. So this is the promise of Scripture because there'll be no more death in the life to come. Let's continue on. Question number 10. How will the relationship between man and beast be different in the life to come? Let's turn to the first book of the Bible and we're going to Genesis chapter 1 and verse 29. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 29 as we read this. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 29. It says, And God said, See, I have given you every herb that yields seed, which is on the face of the earth, and every tree whose fruit yields seed. To you it shall be for what? What does it say? It shall be for food. Verse 30, Also to every beast, of the earth, to every bird of the air, to everything that creeps on the earth and which is, in which there is life, I have given every herb, every green herb for food, and it was so. 
Then God saw everything that he had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Now, what does this passage tell us? It tells us very clearly that before sin entered the world, that men and women were vegetarians, they were herbivores. The animals that populated the earth were herbivores. There was no there was no killing, there was no eating of flesh products at all in the life to come. So in the restored earth, when the earth is returned back to its Edenic beauty, what can we expect? We can expect, as we've already read, that there will be no killing, there'll be no death, therefore there'll be no meeting. All the animals will be herbivores as it was in the beginning. Let's continue on now because we're looking at Isaiah right in the middle of our Bible. And remember the book of Isaiah was written 720 years prior to uh, the time of Jesus Christ. And in Hosea, Isaiah chapter 11 verse 69 again we see these promises of what God's people can expect in the life to come. So Isaiah chapter 11. And verses 6 to 9 now. And here we read. The wolf also shall live with the lamb. Unheard of. But this is the promise of scripture. The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb. The leopard shall lie down with the young goat. This is incredible stuff. The calf and the young lion and the fatling together. And a little child shall lead them. The cow and the bear shall graze, their young ones shall lie down together. The lion shall eat straw like the ox. The nursing child will play by the cobra's hole, and the weaned child shall put his hand in the viper's den. They shall not hurt nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord as the waters cover the sea." What a wonderful picture God gives us here of the life to come. There'll be no death. There'll be no suffering. There'll be no danger. There'll be no fear in the life to come. And the relationship between man and beast is going to be one of harmony, one of, of peace, not of fear, not of trepidation, but of peace, safety and comfort. Let's move on now as we look at the summary the summary section asks us, summarize the benefits of often thinking about eternal life. So think about this. What would be the benefits? What are the benefits of you in thinking about the life to come? What are some of the positive? When I think about that, it helps me to realize that some of the challenges that I'm dealing with here, they're not always going to be here. That these things will pass away, that eventually it will pass away. So it gives me motivation to continue keeping on, so to speak, in my relationship with Lord with the Lord, not because of the reward, but, you know, it's a nice little aside to think of that this body of mind that's aging and this attitude of mind that sometimes is not as it should be, it's all going to be changed and we're going to be renewed and um, uh, as mankind was before sin entered the world. And that is something to look forward to and imagine a world where there's no danger, where there's no fear. We can't imagine it, but it's true and the Bible promises that it's going to be the case. All right, let's go now to our reflection section. Press pause because you'll probably need some time to think about your answer in the summary section. Let's go to the reflection section. Why is a universe without sadness and death so appealing? Why is a universe without sadness and death so appealing. So think about that answer. Why is it so appealing to you? Why is the universe without sadness and death so appealing? Well, the very first thing that I can think of is that families will not be split up by death. Children will always be with their mothers and fathers. In that place, animals are not going to be shot tortured, killed for their food, all those sort of things. There are a number of wonderful reasons. Question number two in the reflection section asks, how do you feel about worshipping God face to face? Now that's quite a sobering question. How do you feel about worshipping God face to face? I, I have to admit that it fills me with joy to be able to acknowledge and to pray and to thank God face to face, 
but also when we think of the way the Bible depicts men and women who, or men who came in the presence of God and what their reaction was, the Bible tells us that um, Isaiah fell down like a dead man. He says, woe is me, I'm a man of unclean lips. But remember this, that in the life to come, the fallen nature is replaced with the renewed nature. And we don't have bodies that break down. We no longer have those natural drawings to sin. And so the attitude will be one of joy, of happiness, and eager anticipation when we can see God and we can speak to him face to face, when we can see Jesus, when we can communicate with the Holy Holy Spirit face to face. What about our um, guardian angel that has been assigned to us for our entire life and the heavenly host that we're not even aware of? How wonderful it's all going to be. Let's go to the resolution section now. And I hope your worksheet doesn't look like mine. I hope it's filled with writing and circles and stars and all sorts of things for you to go back on and to, to remember. All right, my resolution. I want to be with Jesus in the new life. Therefore, I choose to be a faithful follower of his. So if that's how you're feeling, write your name and then sign off underneath it. Additional study. As I've said before, in reading the additional study, if I'm one -on -one do, doing one-on-one -on -one Bible studies, or if I'm, I'm in a group situation, I'd share the reading with other people. But of course, we can't do that here and now. But I'll try and make it as engaging as possible. Here we start. It begins at the second coming of Christ. Jesus promised that he would come back a second time. He was here once and the world has never forgotten it. However, when he comes back, it will not be as a man of sorrow clothed in the garb of humanity. When Jesus returns, he comes back as King of kings and Lord of lords in power and great glory. The righteous are saved at Christ's second coming. The Apostle Paul says at Christ's second coming, the righteous are gathered up to meet the Lord in the air. They are then clothed with immortality. Even the faithful saints who sleep in the grave will hear the voice of the archangel and will be awakened to come forth without any of the impediments of fallen humanity. Heaven is where Jesus takes God's people. The Bible describes heaven, the place where Jesus takes the righteous as a real place. The New Jerusalem is an actual city which has a circumference of 1,500 miles or 2,200 kilometers. It has four walls and 12 gates of pearl that are never shut. Its streets are paved with translucent gold. In the city is the tree of life which straddles the river of life which flows from the throne of God. The city has mansions which are the homes of the saints. And beyond the gates, well, we just can't imagine how wonderful it's all going to be. The New Jerusalem's food and water supply from the throne of God in the city of the city, from the center of the city flows a river of water of life. The tree of life with multiple trunks bears 12 fruits containing the vital elements. The human race has gone without since Adam and Eve followed Satan into rebellion. The antidote for aging, illness and death. Those who eat the fruit of this tree will have the strength and vitality of youth. That's something to look forward to. Communion with holy beings. One Christian writer has said this. There the redeemed shall know, even as they also, even as they also, they are, even as they, even as also they are known. I'll get it, get it out, yeah. The loved ones and sympathies which God himself has planted in the soul shall there find truest and sweetest exercise. The pure communion with holy beings, the harmonious social life with the blessed angels and with the faithful ones of all ages who have washed their robes and made them white in the blood of the Lamb, the sacred ties that bind them together, the whole family in heaven, these help to constitute the happiness of the redeemed. The end of sin. Jesus Christ is going to eradicate sin and then give authority back to the Father. The earth will be purified. All things will be made new. These are the Bible promises that we can have confidence in because Jesus defeated the devil during his earthly sojourn and because he now lives to make intercession for us. Therefore, the Bible promises regarding the demise of sin are guaranteed. Eden restored. The first two chapters of the Bible tell how God created a perfect world without sin, without pain and without death. 
The earth was as, uh, was as a large, beautiful garden, blessed with a temperate climate, prepared to be the home of mankind for eternity. But Satan and sin ruined what was perfect into something cursed with violence, disease and death. However, in the last two chapters of the Bible, we learn that God will create a perfect world, the earth made new without any trace of sin or death. In effect, it will be Eden restored the way God always intended. Jesus prophesied, Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. These words of Jesus are a part of the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapters 5 to 7. However, Jesus was not referring to this earth marred with sin, but the earth recreated or made new where righteousness will dwell. God, speaking to Isaiah the prophet, promised, Thus says the Lord, who formed the earth and made it, who has established it, did not, who did not create it in vain, who formed it to be inhabited. As inspiration promises, the righteous shall inherit the land and dwell in it forever. The capital of the new earth, the new Jerusalem is the capital city of the earth made new. The Bible says the city of God descends from heaven, resting upon the earth. God answers beyond all expectation the petition in the Lord's prayer. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. When he re relocates the new Jerusalem to the earth, he not only refurbishes the earth, he exalts it. Transcending its pre-fall status, it becomes the capital of the entire universe. Homes in the country. The redeemed will not be confined within the walls of the New Jerusalem. They will inherit the earth. From their city homes, the redeemed will go out into the new earth to build homes, to plant crops, to build and harvest and eat them. At home on the new earth, the promise Jesus made to his disciples will find eternal fulfillment. That where I am, there you may be also. The purpose of the incarnation, God with us, will have finally reached its goal. Here the saved, having the privilege of living among unfallen beings in the presence of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit in the heavenly paradise. Restored. Restored to the tree of life in the long lost Eden, the redeemed will grow up to the full nature of the full state stature of the race. The last lingering traces of the curse of sin will be removed, and Christ's faithful ones will appear in the beauty of the Lord our God, in mind and soul and body reflecting the perfect image of their Lord. O oh, wonderful redemption, long taught, long talked of, longed hoped for contemplated with eager anticipation, but never fully understood. Amen. Well, I hope you enjoyed that study. And it's, to me, it's a great encouragement to think that this earth is not all there is, that there's something else wonderful that God has promised for those who live in cooperation with him. And I hope that that is your desire as well. Next week, or the next time we meet, wherever that may be, uh, we're going to be looking at study number 17. Now, this really connects with study number 16 in eternal life because it deals with what the Bible teaches about the 1,000 years. This is a very important subject because there are many strange ideas around Christianity today about the 1,000 years, but all will be made plain when you have completed this study the next time you and I meet in this fashion. All right, well, why don't we conclude with prayer as is our custom. Remember, if you have any questions, send them into the address that's on the screen now info at theorchardmelbourne.org.au and I will send back a response or one of my team will send back a response or additional material that will help uh, clarify the uh, query that you have. Let's close our eyes for prayer now. Father in heaven, I just want to thank you for the person who is watching this program today. I thank you wherever they may be, whether they're on a train, in public transport, in a public park, at home, in a studio, whether they're meeting with friends or family, whatever the case may be, I pray that you'll bless them in a very special way, that they would gain encouragement from this. And no matter the circumstances of their life, that they can trust your word and they understand 
fully that you have promised that this life is not all, all there is. There is going to be something more wonderful to follow. So, Father, we thank you for Jesus Christ who made this all possible through his death on the cross at Calvary. And I pray that as we each respond to the Holy Spirit, that we would reflect you more perfectly in our lives. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. All right, everyone. It's, again, I say it's been good to be with you. And remember this, the truth has nothing to fear from investigation. I'm Rod Anderson. Goodbye for now.